law in its impact, governance, and future. Uh, just before we start and before I introduce the panel, um, there's a few housekeeping um, rules as we move forward. Could you please uh, turn your microphones off or have them on mute? And also please turn your cameras off. We found that that improves the, uh, the reception of the bandwidth. Um, so that would be very helpful. Um, also, uh, can I just make everybody aware that we will be recording today's event. Uh, so if you do have problems around connectivity, bandwidth, um, that recorded uh, session will be made available to, to you. Um, we really would love you to ask questions and make comment. Um, so please feel free to do that and at, at any time. We're going to be taking questions via, um, via Slido. Um, so you can see from this slide that there is the website which you can uh, you click on and enter the event code hashtag assurity hyphen AI or you can use the QR uh, code next to it. So please uh, enter your question via Slido. We will be monitoring those and we will uh, present them when, when relevant during the session or at the end of the session. So it gives me a great pleasure to present our, uh, our panel today. Uh, we're very lucky. Uh, we've got a wealth of experience represented. Um, and perhaps I could start with our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Saul Robinson. Uh, he's a, a husband, father, and walker of two dogs. And we semi-met those two dogs slightly earlier. Uh, he's an American immigrant, born in the UK, and a long-term resident of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, he holds a bachelor's degree in physics from Imperial College, uh, as does another one of the panel members here. Um, a master's in mechanical engineering from Oban uh, and a PhD in aeronautics from St. Louis University. He's an associate of the Royal College of Science. And after leaving the university for the first time, he pursued a career in aviation. As a result, he holds uh, US and European air transport pilot certificates flight and ground instructor certificates, and has held a federal air agency certificate as a chief instructor. Um, so there's somebody else who has a, a love of flying as well as a, as a fellow aviator. Uh, in his aviation career, he has flown corporate aircraft and taught at Embry-Riddle and at St. Louis University. After many years as a professor at SLU, an opportunity led him to leave academia and build his company. So uh, Saul's company is Brain, is that correct? Have I pronounced that correctly? Yes, that's the correct pronunciation. Brain Analytics, yeah, and that's enabled him to pursue his research interests full time. At Brain, Saul has developed cloud based cooperative artificial intelligence and machine learning applications. In the past four years, he has built solutions for flight simulation, orchestration, and a pilot behavior prediction, multilingual natural language processing classification tasks optical character recognition pipelines, anomaly detection, chatbots, database cloud streaming services, and customer behavior prediction tools. I think you're underachieving. So I've been busy, um, yes. He has authored multiple journal articles in academia covering NLP, data visualization, temporal analysis, and multi-level problems. Um, melding his research and professional experience, he has pending patents related to cooperative artificial intelligence systems. These patents cover systems development and integration, educational programming, and real-time augmentation systems. Uh, welcome, uh, Saul. Um, I'm sure you're going to add something quite uh, quite spectacular to this discussion um, with that wealth of experience behind you. Thank also you. on the panel, we have uh, Russell Ewan. Uh, Russell works at Assurity and is the general manager of Assurity's testing and quality assurance, assurance practice. Uh, Russell leads, defines, and delivers the company's service offerings nationally. Uh, he also drives the direction of Assurity's cloud testing services that deliver technical testing on a pay as you use basis. Um, in his background, he is an experienced IT delivery consultant. He's specialized in strategic quality change on large scale programs in banking, financial services, telecommunications, and government arenas. 
Um, before moving to New Zealand, he enjoyed an IT career across Europe with Deloitte Consulting and Daimler Chrysler before settling on these shores. He is passionate about delivering successful outcomes through co-design, collaboration, and placing people at the heart of change. He's also a passionate fisherman when not spending quality time with his family supporting their equine pursuits. Russ, it would appear, collects horses as I collect stamps. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, that is a passion for his, old, his whole family. And last but not least, and my, my fellow roomie here, Chris Pollard. Uh, Chris also works at Assurity. He's passionate about achieving great outcomes by helping people to be effective and work effectively together whilst harnessing appropriate technologies. Uh, this passion has come through a 25 year journey across technical management, coaching and teaching roles, working with every size of organization from dot com startups to FTSE 100 corporations. Chris was exposed to the joy of agile working in the mid 2000s and has never looked back. He has carried the banner for continuous improvement in his technical work in DevOps roles and in leading and supporting agile transformation programs. Over the last few years, Chris has delivered above the value line, implementing, operating and supporting customers with the digital partner platform. This has ultimately led to the distillation of his experiences into the new Assurity Cloud, a platform as a service that allows organizations to experiment, collaborate and co-design with disparate technologies and multiple parties. Uh, as I said before, Chris is a fellow alumni member uh, with, uh, with Saul. He has a Master's of Electrical and Electronic Engineering with management from Imperial College, University of London, and is associate of the City and Guilds Institute. So I'll, hopefully you'll all agree with me, we have a, a great panel um, and a great session ahead of us. So just to reiterate, reiterate sorry, um, please use Slido. We really do want your questions and comments. Um, and I will plug those in as we go through uh, this morning's session. So without further ado, Cass, I believe you've started recording. Yes, sir. That is great. Um, Saul, I will stop presenting and I'll please ask you to share your screen. Well, thank you. Thank you all. And thank you, Steve, for the wonderful introduction. Thank you. Just give me one moment. I'll start presenting my screen here in a second. Ross, does that look okay? Yes, that's good. Okay. So again, thank you. Today we're gonna to talk about AI and its integration in organizations and how we can effectively embrace that and the, the changes that we see and we're coming out in front of us. The public's access to OpenAI's ChatGPT, Google's BARD have clearly created a shakeup in our collective consciousness. It's something that we know is gonna cause change. And so, you know, generates concern and anxiety amongst people. There's little doubt that this change to the way that we work is coming. But given the circumstances, it's imperative that we survey the terrain and make plans. In this way, rather than being sidelined by new technologies and be concerned about our job, we can actually find opportunities to do our jobs better, to perform well. As professionals and as citizens, it's our responsibility to be informed and prepared. And my goal with the discussion today is to make it part of that process, to make sure that everybody here has a clear understanding of AI, what it does, what it can do, and how it will fit in your organization and, and ultimately in your lives. So I'll make a brief introduction of what I actually do and the company does. So we, a frame we specialize in empowering the subject matter expert. Coming from my perspective and an experienced pilot and instructor, I know the incredible things that people are capable of. Every bit as much as I know about in our inherent limitations. Aviation is a high consequence industry. Any mistake potentially costs a life. 
it's also a very advanced engineering application. In that sense, both the people and the, the machine are at one of the highest levels. And yet today we all take for granted our ability to travel across the planet at nearly a thousand kilometers an hour safely and in relative comfort. That's the combination of the incredible diligence of pilots, cabin crew, ground crew, maintenance, engineers, air traffic controllers, the list goes on. Although not all industries have such high consequences, it's from this frame of reference that I ask the question, as a professional, how can AI help me do my job better? And, and that's the principal focus of what we do, empowering the subject matter experts ensuring that we can do our jobs safer and more efficiently. So on, on to our topics for today. We're going to cover several things. I'll try and walk you through current historical developments in artificial intelligence, touch on some elements of governance, security, and how to integrate it. We've got an hour and a half scheduled for this presentation. And of course, with our questions, we're expecting less than that, but it's still going to take a while. And rather than wait until the end for your questions, we're going to be using the Slido to try and integrate those questions into the presentation. So there'll be several breaks. And during those breaks, we'll try and provide Steve with the opportunity to ask any of the questions that you put in the Slido. So please go ahead and use that. And while you're thinking of questions, put those in that queue. And from my perspective as a former professor, I, I, I really love the feedback. Uh, I like the idea that this is an environment for learning. So those questions, our exchange can only help in that process. Okay, so let, let's dig in and ask ourselves, what is artificial intelligence? And of course, the first thing we do is we put that into Google's BARD and ask the machine, what is artificial intelligence? And it said, systems that can reason, learn, and act autonomously. So while, uh, within this description, I'm going to focus on the word learn and ask what that really means. An AI model is built and initially begins with a random set of parameters. It, it, it's completely random. It has no learning. It's a clean slate, has no memory, no experience. Then that model is iteratively exposed to structured data. You take something that's an empty vessel and you apply structure to it repeatedly. And in each of those repeated operations, mathematically you go through and you update those parameters in the model to maximize the likelihood of getting what you want out of it. So in this way, an AI model learns. It learns from experience that structured data that's provided. But the difference I want to, the clarifying point that I want to make here is that unlike us, it's rather a perfect student of sorts. It maximizes its performance against the data that it's been given. And that's a key point, and I'm going to emphasize it. It's a perfect student. Whereas when people are presented data, we're not perfect students. You and I learn in a broader situated context. That is, we find shallow cuts, we generalize, and we even consider if the learning is worth our effort. And if any of you have children, or you've taught, or you just observed how people learn, people often learn unintended lessons, or even how to resolve problems without ever addressing the problem directly. For example, people cheat. So if we keep in mind this, this, this difference in how we learn versus the machine learns, but let, let's go through a little bit of the history first and then how these things operate. Sorry. I need to go back to the beginning because it already played through. Let's introduce the different branches of AI and their common application. If you ever played a game of chess on your phone or your computer, it was likely against an expert system. 
These are systems where an expert provides a knowledge base, which is used to infer the ne next best action on the basis of the user's input. In the case of chess, each user's move is an input to the engine, and then the engine predicts what is the next best move by the computer. Expert systems are, are work well, but they fall behind performance of all of the other approaches that we're going to talk about. Um, so they're falling out of favor. Machine learning as a domain consists of many different mathematical approaches. Some are algebraic and others pure statistics. Given the number of approaches, I'm just gonna show you one novel application of machine learning, so really how to apply it. In this example, let's consider how to build an esports team. It's a billion dollar industry. It's a fun example, so we'll look at that. Many of you might be uh, familiar with the popular video game Overwatch or the many team games like it. The game consists of two teams of five players attempting to beat one another to an objective. In our scenario, you would want to know who to recruit and how best to win a game. Given that each player can select one of many characters, character selection is a key determinant of which team will win. So using machine learning, we can predict which character selection is most likely to result in that win that we desire. In both the case of knowing and not knowing the other team's character selection. So in our example, we can take user statistics and tournament results as our data set, and we can use it to predict the odds of a win given a character's choice. Uh, given a data set, we need to choose a model and train that model. Of the many choices, I'm doing it here with the decision tree because it's easy to interpret and show you how it works. Knowing the other team's composition and our diagram of the train model, we simply need to traverse each of the steps to calculate the probability of a win. I, I, I did this, and as it turns out, this is about 70% accurate on that very simple model. Moving to neural networks, they're highly flexible and could be applied to classification problems as well as predicting numerical output values. But unlike the machine learning group of approaches, a neural network is constructed at the discretion of the architect. They're formed from these tiny computational components connected in a network. Similar to our nervous system is formed by the synapses connecting neurons in a network. Neural networks are often split into classifications by their size and the individual types of computational unit that they use. The definitions of a simple neural network versus the deep learning networks that you hear about are just based on size. So small is a simple, a big one is a deep neural network. For the individual computational units themselves, the neurons, the differences are mathematical. I'm only going to cover a, a couple just to give you an idea. Principally, we'll start with the standard neuron, or the perception as it's called, which is the most simple. This consists of multiple inputs that are weighted and summed together to trigger an activation function and generate an output. You can actually think about this as the line fit problem as you used in high school. The weight, so the gradient of that line, and as the values coming in exceed some threshold, it triggers a value for the output. So you go past the threshold, you trigger the response on the output, which informs the neurons downstream of it. You'll note from my description that these standard neurons don't have a memory of anything that happens before them. So in order to address this problem at the neuron level, you have the type of neuron called a recurrent neuron that was introduced. In this type, each individual neuron contains an additional set of values that carry over from the neuron's prior interaction. In this manner, the neuron remembers its history of trigger events. In this type of a model, we can capture sequential events like an hourly temperature forecast or even a language model. Or, although current neurons have a memory of prior events, they don't encapsulate time variable events. In applications where exact timing of an event 
not just a sequences imperative, you have to use a spiking neural network. These are less developed and there's more research going on there, but they closely resemble nature's approach to these problems. They're intrinsically uh, sensitive to changes over time, just as your eyes and brain process visual information. When we look at a common optical illusion, we can see that dependence on change. The image here isn't moving, but because your eyes make tiny movements to compensate for that dependence on change, the image appears to have motion. For similar problems where changes can occur at any time, these spiking neural networks are particularly effective, both from a computational and a performance sense. That's a very quick covering of what AI is, but for a moment, let's turn it to what it is not. AI and particularly large language models are not true intelligence or general intelligence, as it, we'd normally call it. Although they mirror the human linguistic behaviors at tremendous levels, they struggle with higher level reasoning tasks. So for the diagram purposes, I've just kept that outside of our neural network for now. So having covered very quickly, what is the different domains of artificial intelligence? Let's look at some of the key events in its history that bring us to today. The history of artificial intelligence goes back a long way, beginning about the 1940s with the perceptron, or what was also called the threshold logic unit of McCulloch and Pitts. They actually attached this to an analog system with inputs from a 400 pixel camera. And they were able to do things like identify dog versus cat from those images. In the time in between now and the 2000s, were lots of significant advances in the field uh, from machine learning and neural networks. Applications included voice transcription and the domain of natural language processing, including machine translation, text summarization, going out to the uh, machine vision, hand recognition, and genetic algorithms. I'm sorry for that. That's a child abduction alert. Uh, however, in the more recent past, the paradigm shift came with the use of graphics cards for model training just with neural networks. So in a research paper called the GPU implementation of neural networks, a Korean team made a key insight on the nature of the neural networks and their relationship and how they're used with consumer graphics cards. The small mathematical operations that a GPU are optimized for when they render an image are nearly identical to those necessary for training inference in neural networks. Remember that the, the neural network consisted of many simple neurons with simple calculations. In the training calculations for those neurons, we can break them up into many small mathematical operations, all of which can be done in parallel. That is basically what's required when your computer is calculating the images to display on your screen. And that's exactly what a GPU is designed for. So the Korean team's insight brought about a 20-fold improvement in performance with the graphics cards of that day. I said today, the difference between a high-end CPU and a GPU is even greater than it was then. So in perspective, if we consider the AI, or open AI, took several months to train ChatGPT, if we hadn't have had this insight when the uses of graphics cards, this would have taken about a decade to train ChatGPT. And then the next thing that brings us really to our insights of today and large language models is a transformer model. This was introduced in 2017. Transformer is a generative model and you've probably heard this word generative. That means it's able to generate text by predicting the next word in a sequence and generate new words given a prior set of words. 
So it's always able to predict the next thing in the sequence. This was a breakthrough because it didn't use the recurrent neurons that I just described and that which, which were essential for generative models previously. Instead of doing that, the importance and the position of prior words are encoded numerically in a large matrix, meaning that it's just a big block of numbers to keep track of the position and the importance of every word. Uh, and that matrix is what's referred to here as attention. This is an attention mechanism, as the paper's title refers to it. Unlike the recurrent neuron approach, which had the tendency to forget very long sequences, the memory of the transformer's attention mechanism scales with the size of those matrices. So not only does this approach allow for a greater memory than the prior approaches, but it also allows for a parallel computation of those matrices. The outcome is that the transformers are both more capable and faster to compute the result. So it, it was a vast paradigm shift that accelerated the way in which these language models were built. So if we have a look at Hardy's work, from the animation, you can see that the process begins with the transformation of the tokens or the words into a numerical representation. And that's the dots at the top. That step is called an embedding step. When using the transformer self-attention mechanism, it combines the information from the complete set of the input words and their position. It then has a representation of the word in its context relative to the other words in the set. You see, there are multiple roles and these multiple self-attention mechanisms, which are generated in parallel, those allow uh, the, the model to attend to more than one aspect at a time. Note that the transformer model is able to represent the input word token by its relative position, but not the time between those events. That means that this approach can be represent the written word, but not the spoken word, nor could it represent aircraft flight telemetry or any s system where time is significant and the differences between them. It can only represent the order of events of this thing. We also are highlighting here that there's a limitation around the attention mechanism itself. That attention mechanism stores the prior sequence of words and their relative importance. This is the memory which is used in the neural network to make the prediction. Well, the size of that memory is limited and fixed. The memory of ChatGPT is about 32,000 tokens. It sounds quite a lot and it achieves really impressive results, but it's still relatively a goldfish. Considering the average size of a novel is over 100,000 words, it isn't very large. And uh, in the market right now, we're seeing competitors coming out with models that are much larger in terms of their attention mechanism. Uh, uh, recently, a model with a memory of 100,000 tokens was released by Anthropic. And their major selling point that was able to summarize a novel, their example being The Great Gatsby which is about 180 pages, if you check it out on Amazon. So it's not particularly long. However, if you would think about this in terms of a longer book, let's say Lord of the Rings, consider that the model would forget the characters through the course of the book. We know that the hobbits, Pippin and Mary, Mary rather, are hev heavily developed early on, but there are, there are long sections where characters are not attended to. That would mean that upon their return, they would be completely absent from the transformer's memory. Me meaning that it will be new characters at that point. So I think we can say that a book reviewer's job is fairly safe right now. So 
we've quickly gone through the major developments. I, I want to transition into neural networks and how they actually work as a demonstration. So could I just offer a pause there? My apologies, but we have a fire alarm off going off in our building. So I'm going to move to my phone and exit the building. OK. So that gives us two alerts today already on the conversation, which is perfect. Well, surely AI should have told them that fire alarm was going. <laughs> it's not, okay, I'll go back to mute. <laughs> well, perhaps it could have told us, given us a better idea of context for alarm and why. Okay, so we'll move on to how the neural network actually functions. So we said it consists of simple computational units that are all connected in a complex web. So to understand how they work and are trained, let's let's start with something simple, and we'll we'll train our neural network to how to aim while bowling. Rather than take ten pins, let's take six just for this demonstration, so we have a simpler diagram. If you look where the arrows located, you can see you get the idea that. If I want to aim for four, two, one, three, or six, I just aim for them. But five is hidden behind the one. So in our very simplistic approach, let's say if I need to hit five, I'm going to aim for one. And so we can look at that in a standard representation. And, and, and this is a traditional representation of a neural network. We've got the input layer on the left, the outputs on the right, and the hidden in the middle. The input layer is the information that comes in, the things that we're using to make a prediction. So we're saying aim for five. The output layer shows us the result, the thing that we actually want to predict. So in our six pin bowling example, we're assuming that we want to hit the five pin. And given the layout and the structure of that problem, we'd actually want to aim for the number one pin. For the other pins, you're, you're just going to aim for that pin because of where they're from. So before we train this model on any data, all of these models are initialized. They begin by actually having random values. So if you consider that when you start randomly with input and output, it looks a lot like a pachinko machine where the ball drops. So we'll change our visualization and, and look at it in those terms for a second. And hopefully this helps everybody make sense. So here I'm going to click on this. Initially, before the training has occurred, a model has a model's learned that your input will result in a random output. So we're always going to get something that's random from an input, just like a pachinko machine. You drop something in the top, the ball goes through, bounces off the random pins. So we're always going to get a random output. But in our case, we have something that's not so random. We have to have the ability to control the weight between those different connections. We can adjust them. We can direct them. So where a ball falls, we can redirect it from the bottom to the top. So it's more like we've got this directed approach to all of the pins that are no longer around. And so in this sense, we can allow the balls to fall through. And each through each operation, we can make adjustments from the bottom to the top. And in this bottom to a top approach, we're back propagating a desired result upstream through all the hidden layers and, and changing their weights. If we do this through many, many training cycles, the weights are in this case, the angles of all those pegs are adjusted incrementally to get the result that fits the data every time. So at some point we have a heavily rigged pachinko machine, which means that we drop the ball in the slot that represents the bowling pin that we want to hit. And then it will tell us 
with the output the result at the bottom where we need to aim to get the most likely result in the case of the excuse me pachinko machine we're saying most likely because you drop the ball and even in this weighted system there's going to be some degree of randomness or, or what you call non-deterministic behavior so the ball could still bounce around and end up in another slot at the bottom the neural network has a very similar property it provides us with probabilities of the outcome rather than the definite results so we get a probability distribution just as though the ball's majority were actually going in the one slot at the bottom when we put in the five slot at the top um, and I want, I want to highlight that as an important observation uh, for all, all our use of neural networks and large language models. The output that we receive is a set of probabilities. So the, and that means that given a prompt, whether you put something to chat GPT, BARD, or anywhere else, every calculation it makes in generating the response is a set of probabilities. And those probabilities are likely out of different words. And actually, every time it, it resamples that distribution of possible words, which means that every time you get something slightly different, making that behavior probabilistic or non deterministic in its result. So at that point, if Steve, you want to put in we can do, or I can continue on into my predictions on the future. Uh, look, thank you very much, Saul. Uh, that's absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, yeah, I'm already feeling very small. Um, we've got some great questions that come through. Um, one um, which is of a slight ethical nature. So, um, Saul, um, I hope you're ready for this one. Um, it's from Andrew Robbins, and what ethical issues apply to the way that modern AIs have been trained using large amounts of data that the people providing the data did not necessarily own? That's something, it, that's a prescient question. So that's something I'm going to get into a little bit later. Fantastic. All right. So and, and, yep. No, it's okay. If, if we're going to uh, we're going to address it later, uh, so we will we'll do that. Um, and I've got some old questions here, slightly more technical in nature. Um, what is the new hardware for generative AI? Uh, Nvidia is working on a chip for generative AI. Will this be similar to how graphic cards work with AI? Uh, there, there are several of these new generation changes that are mapping to different approaches that are specific to the task. Um, I, I don't think it's come clear yet which are the best approaches. In most cases, it's for specifics of vision processing or optimizing the, the existing process. But in some cases, and I'm being specific with things like um, graphical neural networks, those models can be very, very large and they don't fit or match to the current hardware particularly well. So often those kind of jobs end up on the CPU as a more general purpose hardware. Uh, the same used to be true. Uh, you know, anything that's rather big, because the graphics cards processing units are very small, it can often get a little bit too big for the application. So. But there's lots of research and development being done on a specific application. Thank you. Thank you, Saul. Um, another question around uh, ChatGPT. Is there a way to augment ChatGPT with our own data, but keep it separate? Or in the ChatGPT sense, no. That's a proprietary, it's a big black box. They're selling you a product in the case of some of the open models that are being available then yes we can retrain those models with our own data i i would point out that although you can modify it 
to your purpose, you can't fundamentally change its behavior without retraining your own model from scratch. There are some intrinsic elements that you retain, even on what you might see as retraining those models, unless you have a significant amount of hardware to do it. Thank you, Saul. Um, I think I'll hold the other questions until we get the next, uh, the next gap. So please continue. All right, then. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about the future and we'll get into governance and ethics and applications. So I don't think there's any question that the complex data projects that we previously were outside the realm of automation and are completely possible. We're going to see disruptive innovation and we're seeing disruptive innovation happening right now across multiple domains. There's no doubt that just as the spinning jenny in the picture here started the industrial revolution, we're in that phase of AI driving a new revolution. We can expect that changes to how we work and how we interact online. Um, but the thing that I'm going to bring up here in this element, and perhaps the most important lesson from the Industrial Revolution, is the way it changed economics. I, I want you to think about 2023 as a marker point, the year that generative AI came to the internet. Prior to this year, content was almost certainly created by a human. But that's not true anymore. And in many aspects, AI generated content is indistinguishable from human generated content. Thus, all online media is now, I would say, contaminated by AI. And it's in that particular aspect that I'm gonna say the economics of the internet changed most drastically. If you consider the websites and their entire content is already being generated by an AI in order to actually farm or game Google's ad revenue system, then you're asking questions about economics and for advertisers, why would a business spend any advertising dollars if there was a chance that no human has interacted with that site? It can be that it's solely generated for the very purpose of generating revenue and pretending to be real people and steal people's money. So we've now got these changes in the economics, change the motivations towards things like proving that you're a real person and or proving that there's an absence of AI contamination in the data. And it's in that thought process that I, I think that where we have data that's able to be certified as free from this contamination that's for people and it's your data, that becomes really, really important. That data is about more valuable than ever before. When we're getting to questions of governance and regulation and ethics. I, I'm going to begin with a question. Ask how many people have actually used ChatGPT or BARD here. And of course, I don't expect an answer, although Steve, Chris, Ross, you can answer if you want. I'm going to follow on that with, did you read the licensing agreement? And then I'm going to ask, would you be surprised if your data, the stuff that you shared is no longer yours? Would you be surprised if we were unable to hold them liable for anything it produced? Would you be surprised if you didn't own anything that was produced? Meaning that they've claimed ownership of your company's product if you used it at work. Navigating the legal compliance and maintaining the intellectual property whilst actually using these tools <laughs> it is difficult for anybody. But we also have the pressure from big tech attempting to secure a dominant position. They're calling this, they describe this as create a moat around their market. You should definitely be concerned, but I, I don't think it's likely that they'll be able to build this moat. Simply put, they don't own the training data and other large language models have been made openly available. So meaning that the tools are available for us 
and the axis is there. So in that first point, they don't own the training data. So the question I'd ask is, who owns the internet? The data that's being used to train the current batch of the large language models isn't owned by OpenAI, Meta, Google, or any other company. That textual data was scraped from the internet, and, and thanks to Disney, publishers, and record labels around the world, copy applies to all creative works almost uniformly globally. That right applies without registration, applies without special notation, and it even applies when you publish it in public. But often, when you post data online, you do so through another business, something like Twitter, Stack Overflow, Facebook, and elsewhere. And when you do so in their licensing agreement, you often give away your copyright to that company. Now, it doesn't make that work truly public when you do that. Rather, you're exchanging, transferring your copyright to that company, giving them some rights. Which means that companies own a great deal of the works that ChatGPT was trained on. And so we're now at the point where people are trying to claim their legal share. And you can see that in the co-pilot copyright lawsuit. People own the copyright to some of the information that it was trained on. But it, it doesn't end here. Anyone else here? Potter and Alan Rickman's voice. Not only is there a public work within the training data, but there's almost certainly illegal, illegal, illegally obtained copyright material within that data as well. It, it's well documented that within the common crawl data set, which is the crawl through the internet, that is the foundation of many of these models. There are hundreds of thousands of instances of the copyright symbol in there. Your data is in there, my data is in there, and it was all used to train one of these models, possibly all of them. We don't know. Uh, this is where we, in one legal aspect, in copyright, but it's certainly not the only one. Current criminal laws cover the developments with large language models as well. I think the most dangerous one for AI companies is data protection. These laws protect individual citizens' right to privacy and their well being. OpenAI has been opaque with their model specifications, but we know that from Metro AI's Llama model, it was trained in 1.4 trillion tokens. In that sense, and so much data, we, we have the question of how can a model vendor comply with data protection and its right to be forgotten? As far as I'm aware, given the model construction and their training process, the only way to truly comply is to remove the information from the data set and then retrain the model from scratch. And, and that's after you've been able to effectively search for matches in very unstructured data for your data, which in of itself would be me searching terabytes of information and costing you a massive computational overhead. We're at the point where the, all, all these existing laws will take years to work through the legal system. Uh, but we've also got the concern of future government regulation and that remains still remains unclear. We know that regulation is trailing research, commercial use, and public use already. In the most recent report from 2019, the New Zealand government highlighted the issue with establishing regulatory agencies for AI. There are just no examples of effective governance in this area. And this isn't unique to New Zealand. This is the same everywhere. Governments around the world are scrambling to work out just how to govern. Uh, Governance and serving the public is difficult enough when there are corporate setting, where there are limited companies to manage, where they can apply rules to companies and have them comply. But with the recent release of Meta's Llama model that ended up being public, the technology is available to the consumer level. As a result of this citizen science, 
the field is accelerating exponentially. Over the course of weeks, models are, are being generated with chat GPT levels of performance and are being published to the web on a Hugging Face website. And, and the most surprising fact, and perhaps what's keeping OpenAI awake at night, is that these advances didn't require a million dollars of hardware. There is no moat in this sense. They don't own the data. They're going to have problems maintaining the data. And the, the models, the hardware, the process is eminently accessible with a non-million dollar investment. So in terms of regulation, we have a very difficult job ahead. The Pandora's box has opened and we're going to see it affect all and every elements of life around those. Um, and this is because the cost of creating content at the human level suddenly diminished and it became freely, almost freely available. And this is, you know, gives us some potential problems when we think about the unique abilities of AI and there are liabilities as well. What makes AI unique, and this is what I'm going to address when we talk about security. When we address security in generally in software, we would focus on protecting an application from a malicious actor. But with AI, we have to consider this whole subject of hallucinations and the fact that it costs a lot to operate. And both of these things are potential attack surfaces that might cause real business problems. The hallucinations of the large language models generally fall into a broader category of adversarial attacks. So if we focus on adversarial attacks for a while, I'll, I'll do that over several sides, and then later on we can talk about software development and improving our performance. If you look at the figures for a moment, on the left side is a picture of a bus. In the center, there is a noisy pattern. On the right, there is a combination of the original image and the noisy image. And you can see that here are the label the, the model gave the image on the right, which is very clearly a bus, it labeled it as an ostrich. This is an example of an adversarial attack or a hallucination. As we discussed earlier, mathematically, AI models maximize accuracy above everything else. And as a result, they explo exploit the most effective predictive features from the data, whatever that may be. That data may contain features which, when viewed from a human selected notion of similarity are very fragile, just like the bus versus the ostrich. For a classification task, this might mean that the bus is labeled as an ostrich, but from the human perspective, this is ridiculous. And yet it demonstrates that an, the image contains features that we simply aren't aware of. So the implications of Leo Sattel's paper are subtle, but are, are of tremendous ramifications for security and governance. And I'll quote the research paper directly. Adversarial examples can be directly attributed to the presence of non-robust features. Features derived from patterns in the data distribution that are highly predictive, yet brittle and incomprehensible to humans. After capturing these fe features within a theoretical framework, we establish their widespread existence in standard data sets. So to restate that, these brittle, incomprehensible features are present in all data sets. So be before we give you an example of how AI differs wildly from human selected notions of importance, and we see these artifacts that these hallucinations or adversarial attacks within large language models. Let's go back to something similar that happens between humans as well, albeit less frequently. I, I, I don't know how many people saw blue and black versus white and gold on this 
internet phenomenon. But it's not just AI that perceive fundamental concepts differently. We base our interpretation of color not only on the information that we get from our sensory inputs and our eyes, but also on image illumination and our brain's assumptions about that illumination. If you see the image differently than somebody else, you're simply prioritizing different features in the data above others. We, we might say that this is a human hallucination and difference here. So where we talk about that paper and its implications, I suggested this paper to one of my colleagues. And like the particularly savvy fellow that he is, he asked the machine to do it. So he, what he did, he pasted the link from the reference and asked ChatGPT to summarize the 10 major points. And let's have a look at what it told them. Sure, here are the 10 major points from the paper. Number one, graph neural networks, GNNs, are a type of neural network that can operate on graph structured data. Number two, GNNs have been applied to various fields such as computer vision, natural language processing, and recommendation systems. So if you recall anything that I just said about that paper, you should be raising your eyebrows. The summary isn't about that paper. It's not even a bad summary about that paper. It's about a completely different subject and a completely different paper on graph neural networks. And it's here I'm going to point out that ChatGPT and all of the large language models are optimized to best predict the next word or token in a sequence of those trillion tokens. There's no human notion, there's no relevance, there's no anchoring of what those words or tokens actually mean. Simply the process maximizes the model's predictive ability and scores it. So this is not the paper that we're looking for. So not only do we have to deal with these hallucinations, but we also have to consider the cost of our operation. Just like any other service, we have to engineer that server to be resilient to abuse and bad actors. But the API serving costs for chat GPT are very, very high. Some estimates place this number at pennies per response generated. If you gener generate an image, the cost is even more expensive. The abuse of these online services transition from being an annoyance to potentially business disruptive cost. Preventing abuse without advers adversely affecting users and your developers is a challenge that requires serious attention. So with that quick discussion of governance, do we have any questions that you'd like to push, Dave? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll pose that um, that ethical question now, Saul, or, or do you want to delay it a little bit longer? No, we can go ahead with that once yeah, more. Okay, so if you repeat. Yeah, so the, the question was, what ethical issues apply to the way that modern AIs have been trained using large amounts of data that the people providing the data did not necessarily own? And I think you, you, you covered it to an extent in, the, um, in your narrative. I don't think that we adequately cover that in this approach okay. and this data. I honestly believe that these lawsuits are going to aggressively divide OpenAI, BARD, et cetera's work and, and result in a more distributed system. I think by their approach, that it means that it, it really will be broken up and we're going to see an importance of localized training data that really is um, you know ethically sound because it's approved and applied to within your domain thank you so um actually there's a question here that I, that i can answer um simon said clearly blue and black well i saw white and gold so i think it's <laughs> actually white and gold um what kind of uh, skills and capability would a business need to have on a payroll or brought in to train a model? 
um, you know, around imagery, object recognition, for instance. All right. So if you're looking at, we there there are degrees of this, right? So if we've yeah. got basic character recognition, optical character recognition levels, or you say, what is this image about? We that scales up. If you want to do image generation, that's something very different with a different degree of hardware. In terms of expertise and equipment necessary, if you're looking at classification tasks for images, that can be done on consumer grade hardware. So nice equipment is good enough to do most of those things. Whereas generative models for images and more complex operations like you may have seen like building 3D maps from multiple images or pasting those images together to build some other object. That's heavy duty equipment. Uh, in terms of expertise in house, I think I'd always recommend that there's some D, there's a balance of you can't bring in all of the expertise, but you've got to have a degree of expertise on staff so that you know what maps between your existing product, your services, what you do, and is able to fact check, you know, to check the woman in and make sure it's valid and you're well understood for your application. And that's something I touch on in a little bit as well. Great, Paul. Maybe just one more, and then and then we'll move on. Um, I've got a question from Amy. Uh, considering the struggle to regulate AI and the pace at which it's been developed, would you recommend to slow down development? I don't think it can happen. That uh, the, the genie's out of the bottle. When when there are too many available techniques for you to be able to train this kind of model on consumer hardware. It's been demonstrated that you can run very, very slowly a, a large language model on a tiny piece of hardware like a Raspberry Pi single board computer, which is just insane. But it just demonstrates the point of how far it's gone and how Google, OpenAI have nothing at this point. The modelers, you can download it from the Hugging Face website, some great models. And by next week, there will be a new model there that you can run on your PC that is ever better and closer to the performance of GPT-4 and everything else. I think Google and everybody else know it, and, and there's just no way of putting that back in the back because it's already on the internet. Um, great answer. Thank you, Saul. Um, yeah, please, please continue. Okay. You just on mute, Saul. I pressed the wrong button. Thank you very much. Okay. So, can you, Ross, can you see my screen? Are you all good? Yes. All right. Awesome. So let's talk about how to and the adoption and ownership process. So from my perspective, from an aviation background, I, I'm quite familiar with the concepts of accountability and culpability. After all, the pilot commanded the airplane accepts absolute and final responsibility for the safety operation of flight. So in a high consequence industry like aviation, you know, this all makes sense. But it means that high consequence industries are, are perhaps somewhat more uniquely placed in their study of AI adoption, both because, really because they have the most to gain and the most to lose. Augmentation, cost reduction, improvements in safety are all things that are valuable there. So where we apply AI to such an industry, We'll ask ourselves what are legal, ethical ramifications in the context of safety and internal governance and our ethics. So we're going to begin with pointing to a research study. Uh, and this is in the reference in the white paper here. And this study was titled AI Adoption in Healthcare. In this work, researchers conducted semi-structured interviews with health professionals to 
better define the requirements for adequate organizational governance of AI systems in healthcare settings and support healthcare system leaders to make more informed decisions around AI adoption. Okay, so they're basically generating a list of how to best implement or adopt AI in your organization, particularly with healthcare. So this is high consequence and something that we can really dilute as necessary. And their are findings are well articulated. It's a great paper and it mirrors my own experience and, and really what I would recommend to you. And one of the not key points from the paper, but one of my takeaways from this is that there's a general recognition that algorithms do not replace expertise. So our subject matter experts are still safe in their, their positions. So we got several key findings and they really generated somewhat of a checklist for, for AI in, integration through a high consequence organization. But I'm just gonna focus on two here across two slides. AI adoption requires a thorough understanding of the line workers, daily issues and leadership's identified priorities. Once the organization problems are laid bare, it requires the subject matter expert involvement on all sides, the AI and the domain. And knowing where AI can be applied and how effective the implementation can be is a trade-off. And you can only evaluate that as part of a concerted effort and something that's driven by example by working through the problems. That trade-off requires an acute understanding of the highly abstract limitations of AI and the machine learning process in general. So I'm going to walk you through compliance with data protection just as an example of a problem with how we understand the data and why it requires a bit of expertise between the two, two groups or interaction. In the case of data protection, an issue might be very, very infrequent. From an accuracy perspective, it can make sense to ignore it. In the not so extreme case, if data protection issue only occur in 2% of cases, a model that labels everything as normal is 98% accurate. If we remember that the algorithm maximizes its performance based on the measures that we give it, of error. So in the rare cases where there's something's rare and high risk, a model that captures all of the problematic cases will be more important than overall accuracy measures. With our education involvement from the SMEs and the developers, a model can simply be hazardous. In this case, as we see on the screen, what you see across on this axis in the horizontal is the number of normal cases. Across the top in that 2% band is the data protection cases. Of course, we all know that data protection or some compliance issue, this band we wanna get right. This might be something that's very expensive or very destructive to an organization. Whereas where we get it wrong in saying, oh, it's data protection, you better check that. And that's incorrect, it isn't a data protection. This might take five minutes of a person's time to verify. And accordingly, it's relatively cheap than failing compliance where we'd fail to capture this band up here. When it comes, um, when it comes time to implement an AI into a business process, it's important to note that theory is different than practice. Real life data is almost certainly different than the sample data that was used to build that model. So, in application, with this in mind, it's best to run models in a shadow deployment if you can, ensuring that the experience of the end user is what was expected. An evaluation can then be followed by a pilot study and a feedback loop for the integration. And in this case, since users are engaged in the development process because their opinion matters, their buy-in improves and acceptance is generally improved. The incremental approach like this has the additional benefit of mitigating risks. There's, there's a process of integration. Risk is limited first by scope and then by the review process prior to a broad adoption. And since the review process engages everyone involved in the workflow, not just the scientists, the managers, 
our overall organizational risk is minimized. The people on the floor tell you it doesn't work or what works correctly. So that brings us into how best to integrate AI with people and process. AI is generally being built and thought of as being able to complete tasks in an autonomous way. Yet, according to the Harvard Business, Business Review, the most productive organizations have humans and machines working together. So in order to excel with this new technology, organizations really need to leverage the strengths of AI and the humans involved. This begins with understanding both participants in situ. This understanding requires a process that needs subject matter experts from both sides. It then requires that the AI is trained to complete the task fragment in the manner that makes the most sense to the humans. And in this way, we can accelerate our productivity, but our, also our ability to make effective decisions. In order to understand how to create an effective cooperative relationship between AI and humans, let's first try and understand how cognition, how our understanding can be divided amongst multiple agents in their environments. So let's walk through an example. So have a look at this picture of a, in the cockpit. One of the things you'll, you might notice is that the checklist was placed between the power levers. The pilots use their environment to communicate and condition their actions. In this case, the checklist position indicates that a checklist is incomplete. So before they can advance the power and move, they have to move the checklist. This is one element and a facet of distributed cognition. It's a physical memory shared by the crew. That memory says that they stopped their procedure partway through. Pilots have these many of these uh, seemingly strange little rituals to communicate and record and condition their process as they fly an airplane. Here they're communicating through abstractions. that are common and understood in situ. There's no need for a verbal exchange between each of the crew members in something that's so very critical. In a system with distributed cognition, there's only need for a common understanding of the mission and the channel of communication. Well, this is with pilots between humans. In this example of distributed cognition, we have a human and a dog communicating through a shepherd's whistle. The shepherd is making different whistle calls to tell the dog which direction to drive the sheep. Here, each individual in the system complements the other. The dog not only, not only has training, but it has its own expertise. It anticipates the sheep's movements at a level that's way beyond a human's understanding. The human scaffolds the dog's understanding by making the decisions on where the sheep need to go. The problem that the system solves is not solvable individually. Where the unique resources from each individual in the system complement each other's interdependent actions, this is actually has a name and it's called complementarity. With AI, the distributed cognition of the system doesn't need to be simple in the flight, for example, nor does it need to be limited human to human, as we see in the Hurden example. And it's this interface where we complement each other's interdependent actions that we need to seek the best applications of AI. The study of this is called cooperative AI. Here, the degrees of autonomy are essential but it's obvious that we're most productive when we collaborate. And, and you know, you could argue that the success of our species is dependent on collaboration. So I think we need to consider AI as a co cooperator, something more like the herding dog to the shepherd. But when we do so, and when we integrate AI, we also have to consider the limitations uh, that frame our relationship with AI. 
In the case of aviation, we've had a cooperator for many decades. It's called an autopilot. The autopilot, much like the herding dog, doesn't know anything about the big picture. When we train a flight crew, we expose them to a barrage of emergencies in the simulator. If you might imagine, when you receive an engine failure after takeoff, you get rather busy. The crew gets very busy. It's here in the stressful moments that the role of the automation and its proper use actually gets hammered into the pilots. If in that scenario with the engine failure, if even for a moment, if both of the pilots look down to focus on some task like a checklist related to the emergency, the instructor will immediately pop up with who has the airplane. And the answer here is never the autopilot is flying the airplane. And that's because one of the crew should always be maintaining situational awareness and flying that airplane. The autopilot might be on, but the autopilot will happily drive the airplane into an unsurvivable situation. And with any AI and with any automation, we have to consider it in the same manner. It will happily drive the bus off the cliff. It will happily drive the airplane straight to a moon. And with that, we've got a moment for questions, and then we're gonna I'm gonna hand over to uh, Ross and Chris. Do you have any questions that we'd like to pop in, Steve? I, I know we're yeah, thank you, Saul. Yeah, we've got quite a few have popped up here, which is great. Um, first one um, from Dayron: What will be the effects caused by plugins powered by AI? specifically plugins implemented in tools we are already using on a daily basis. I, I think that's going to vary a lot based on the application. As of the result of the broad distribution of some of these tools, people are going to apply it everywhere, and it's going to take a while to figure out what works. And in the process, we're going to make mistakes, and nasty things will happen. As you may be aware, the, there was a legal filing where they used ChatGPT to generate some of the legal briefs, and it made up cases just as it made up the research paper. It made up a case, and those lawyers received a five thousand dollar fine, and they will be probably disbarred if they try anything like that again. And we're going to see lots of those examples. It, it's going to be try everything, and we'll see what see what sticks. I think. Okay, well, kind of, kind of related to that, Saul. Uh, another question that appeared here, which is a, uh, um, in a government agency, how do we monitor the usage of AI and measure its value, whether positive or negative, to the organisation and to our customers? Uh, there's two potentially very different questions in that one. Can you recognise the AI? If we're talking about it in the sense of you're, you have some text, some content, was this generated by an AI? That can be done. It's not particularly cheap to do. And it depends on the length of the documentation and where, how certain you are to that. So it, that, that's one whole um, question. When you think about value to an organization, I, I Again, that's domain specific. I think only the customer, the, the business, the organization can answer that real question themselves. But I see in uh, some of the work that I do in customer support, where we have AI systems integrate with the, the, the agents, their workflow is maintained steadily, which means that you've got people doing their job bots and AI take over the boring bits. So the people are much more engaged. The workflow is managed and stable. And as a result, the, the dropped calls, the problems all decrease to ridiculously low levels and they're able to handle much more, uh, you know, instability in the workflow as well. Uh -huh. Go ahead. No, I was going to say maybe one uh, one final question at, at this stage. So, um, if you were to put your um, you know, polish your crystal ball, yeah, and look at your powers of prediction, 
Um, the, the, the doomsday scenario out there is that we all end up um, like the passengers in the, uh, the Strata liner on Wally, which are rather large but unthinking blobs. Uh, or do you see AI actually providing a pathway to goodness? I, we, we would go back to what is human behavior and, and humans will try everything and they will generally try and be lazy. In some cases, we're lazy in the really advanced sense and we make things as simple as possible. You know, we write software to do very complex things, right? And we spend hours and hours doing it just so we can be lazy and sit back and go, look, the machine did it. And so there's going to be lots of that and that's human behavior. In many cases, that's going to be a mistake and we've got to go through that sorting process and if we don't want to make drastically terrible mistakes we have to think very carefully about how we apply it and it's just like flying the airplane if you just turn it on let the autopilot always fly the airplane the pilots don't know how to fly the airplane and that is a very bad thing yeah that's a great answer thank you so right and let's, uh, let's at this point hand over to uh, AI in testing. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, it's Lovely. Okay, so um, you know, as you all know, uh, this has sprung into everyone's awareness in in the last few months, so towards the end of twenty two, coming into this year. So we, Assurity, we're we're on the same journey as the other eight billion people in the world. Uh, we're excited, we're enthusiastic, we're also a bit uh, tentative and, uh, you know, wanting to make sure that we, we take a considered and careful approach to adopting and using and, and recommending the use of AI for our customers. You know, we've seen the potential for, for great gains. Uh, we, can, we can generate large amounts of text, we can generate all sorts of interesting code and automation, which is great, but also uh, as we know right now, if you go and look at the, the licenses, there's there's risks around both security uh, and information privacy. So how, how are we dealing with that? Well, the first thing we're doing is we're engaging experts in the field like Saul um, to help give us information and help educate. Uh, we're also actively uh, keeping up with, with advances and developments. We're, we're watching the media actively. We're looking at the research papers, which are coming out very frequently. Um, and we're looking at products, whether they're the opportunity to use open source things or whether they're actually commercial products offered by you know, anyone from Microsoft to more specialized organizations. We're also uh, going about doing some, some kind of grassroots work. Um, we have many enthusiastic people here who are, who are keen as mustard to get into it, start using it, um, find opportunities. So we've already started the process of kicking off a hackathon. We've got some well-formed projects and we're going to be doing a kind of weekend event and letting the staff participate in that. That should be excellent. Click, please. Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, we've, we've already seen a few examples. I'm going to give you a couple of other anecdotes. Um, you know, Assurity is all about, we're about quality, we're about uh, customer success, understanding what our customers want and helping them get the right outcomes. Um, quality is a, a key part of that. Um, also understanding what it is that is wanted and we help make sure that it's being delivered. Um, We've had a couple of examples already where we've tried things out. Uh, one of our engineers was uh, looking looking for some help with some software delivery, and they wanted to use a, a contemporary library that did some OAuth to um, uh, kind of security, some some login and verification. So they talked to Jack, Chat BT, GPT and said, "Hey, how can I use this?" And they, and they went, "Oh, okay, you need to use this uh, version one of the library." And he was like, oh, okay, fine, uh, show me how that would work. And he generated some code. He was like, oh, okay, I'll give that a go. And he, he tried using it. And, and it rapidly became apparent that uh, it wasn't going to work because it was for OAuth 1 rather than OAuth 2. So he went back and said, Chat GPT, I think this is for, the, for OAuth 1. It's not going to work for OAuth 2. Chat GPT went, yeah, oh, absolutely. You're completely right. Sorry, you should use the OAuth 2 library. That's what you want. That's not very helpful advice. Luckily, obviously, our engineer. Panny and uh, knew that there might be some risk around that, so verified it. 
On a similar vein, um, I, I wanted to, to test some of the more kind of business facing ways of using large language models. So I one of the techniques is you can get it to role play. So I said, please, can you be a, an expert financial advisor in the New Zealand market? And that's great. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in knowing about uh, how safe my investments are. If I put the money in, in a bank, uh, is it safe? You know, what happens if the institution falls over? Chat GPT went, oh, it's all good. You're covered. Uh, your, your money's covered. Uh, there's a government guarantee. There's some legislation in place. It's all good. And I knew that that wasn't the case. I knew that that had expired in 2011. So I went and said, oh, OK, I think that's not right. It expired in 2011. This was the legislation. It went, yes, you're absolutely right. That legislation expired here. You're not covered at all. <laughs> if you want to have security in your money, you can't just put it in a bank. So, so that's what we that's what we need to care about. We need to be that human. We need to verify uh, that what we're asking it to do makes sense, and we need to verify and have that expertise, that human in the loop around uh, getting the results we want. So over to Russ. Cool. Thanks. If you could just click, please, Saul. Thank you. So thanks, everyone. I just want to give you a quick overview. This was a um, case study that Nielsen Norman Group did, just to credit them. So they took 440, uh, 444 professionals who had tasks to achieve. They did a lab test. And then they subsequently introduced AI for one of the teams. So half the team produced results without AI and half with um, the AI they used was ChatGPT. Now, it's pretty obvious the productivity was a huge improvement, but productivity without quality is pretty futile. Um, so they actually rated and provided independent rating on the output. And what they quickly found was actually it was an improvement in quality. AI was absolutely faster. It was delivering a better quality output. But there is a reason there is a red line there, and it's actually the increased effort that's required in editing. Um, and, and I think back to Chris's point, it's about the ownership of quality. That's the absolute key thing. AI is going to help us, but we can't be lazy humans. We can't be those blobs. We have to make sure we own the output. We, own, we, we take ownership of the quality, and that's where our expertise has to come into play. We can't be those lazy humans. So if you could just take another click, please, Saul. So I just wanted to give you a little bit about Surety. Our approach is absolutely centered on the success of our clients. Now, our passion is people-centric um, solutions delivery. We employ delivery techniques that really focus on giving our businesses the best outcome. And we do that through spec by example, mind maps. And that is really about breaking down silos and bringing collaboration together at the front. Now, my challenge back to all of us is we've now got multiple um, areas of expertise in delivering software that can now use AI. They can use it. I mean, the testing world, test strategies, plans, reports, it absolutely can be delivered, delivered faster to a higher quality. But you must take that ownership. I've personally trialed ChatGPT um, to look at test strategies um, in the world of ERPs and also applying it to some customer scenarios. Now, the output you get is pretty textbook. It can be very good if you prompt it in the right way. But there's a caution here, um, and this comes back to the ownership and the expertise. ChatGPT will never understand the uniqueness of your client problem unless you tell it. Um, you have to take that ownership. And these techniques help you do that. We use them because they build a shared ownership of success. It helps multiple um, delivery parties all focus on understanding of what good looks like so that we can make sure the right thing is built and built right. And that's a key message that we've got to get to in testing for us now is that these techniques have probably doubled in importance in my opinion in terms of how we bring everyone together to understand what is important and get to it as fast as possible. Cool, so if you just click on one more, Saul, I'm just very conscious of time. Um, well, that's the last one. Yeah, so just. So, so in summary, we've spoken about AI, how it works, the practical legal challenges, the directions it'll take. There, there are just a few points I wanna leave you with to remind you that AI is a perfect student. It doesn't learn the practical lessons that humans do. So the, um, the hallucinations or adversarial examples are features intrinsic to the data. The hallucinations are not going to go away. 
those errors will always exist and they cannot be engineered away from a model. If there, there is to be compliance with civil law and regulation, as well as you know, engendering public trust, both the data and the models must be provably fit for purpose. Although AI has limits, it has tremendous strength. So if we consider it in a cooperative sense and a distributed way, we can leverage that strength. I think uh, to Ross's point, I mean, software development is a process of solving novel problems and humans are very, very good at it as long as they remain diligent. So, thank you. That's it for me. Right on time. On Tuesday. Thank you. Uh, uh, how are we doing? Just trying to get two hands raised suddenly. If okay. Um, what I might actually do, um, we, we have run out of time. What I might do is just um, take some of the final slide of comments if people wish to remain online. Um, I think there are some uh, some interesting discussions still to be had. Um, one that I, I, I like particularly is um, asking about how did ChatGPT develop a political bias? And do you see this as something it will outgrow or something that will continue to be prevalent? Maybe we can ask Saul to uh, to respond to that one. That is a, a wonderful question, again, about human nature. There are lots of records, news stories that inherently contain bias, whether it be... Yeah, you know, Historically, when you think of things historically, there is bias. And if we take the United States, we talk about racial bias in news stories, etc. Those are present in the real newspapers, in the real journal articles. As we change as a culture, as a group of human beings, we're still taking that past history of data with us. And it, again, is a perfect student. It doesn't learn in context. It only sees that data. So it will always represent some of the worst aspects of humanity because it doesn't actually get the real lesson. It only sees the data. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, another question was, um, again, I suppose for you, Saul, in terms of your position on this, um, what is your position on the petition, an open letter signed by leading AI experts that calls for a pause in lab AI development and training? I, I think that's an effort on their part to build their moat, to protect their market. I, I, right. Because they want the legislators to say nobody can do it except the people who have all of the money and all the real technical and advanced people who can take care of it for you don't worry we've got it and it's already too late and it, it's worth saying again open ai are terrified of what's happening on hugging face hugging face is one of the open places that you can push models yeah. from uh, llama's open model within weeks they caught up to chat gpt's performance so they spent millions of dollars, months and months, all the PhDs in the room, and some people with a nice bit of hardware in their basement did it in a couple of weeks. Uh, so, Ouch. Yeah. yes, no, it's not going to work. Okay. Um, there's another comment here as well, which sort of leads on to that, um, that uh, political bias uh, question. Um, do you feel the bias is accentuated by the fact that its main training corpus was English? So it carries that bias based on a cultural perspective? Yes, uh, <laughs> very <laughs> much so. <laughs> sure, that, yeah, more, I, more, of a, more of a commentary than anything else. So. You, you get into a very complex questions about what is language? How does it inform yeah. culture? Is language part of culture? And yeah. all those things are true. And it, it, it if, if the person asking the question would like to do a PhD in linguistics and computational linguistics, we, we can do that 
if everybody on the call would like to do a PhD in that, there's plenty of research available to do so. I was actually going to put it as a chat GBT and see what happened, but never mind. <laughs> um, and one, perhaps one last um, slightly um, technical question, which was more about the capability of AI memory and how quickly do you think that uh, will increase? And are there any limiting factors for the cap? It's based on memory because we're accumulating the position and all of the tokens. So if you think position versus tokens, the, the words rather, it gets into a really, really big matrix really, really fast. So every time you go up into a larger scale, it gets computationally another order of magnitude up there. I think we're going to start reaching a limit in utility of what we see. So I, I introduced that concept of the, the spiking neural network. There are other approaches in there and different types of neurons and applications. I actually expect that those will take over in many aspects of our processing capability because there's a limit to the sequence length. Whereas people, you, if any of you burned your hand on the stove as a child, I'm pretty sure you're all pretty well rigged to not touch the stove in case it's hot ever, ever again your entire life. There is nothing like that that's happening here in ChatGPT and the large language model. Okay. Well, perhaps on, uh, on, on that thought, um, I'd just like to thank uh, all our contributors today. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Saul Robinson, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, what, what time is it um, where you are currently? I'm in the Midwest United States in St. Louis, and it's currently 6.37 in the evening. Oh, um, wonderful. Perhaps you. time just to settle down with a glass of something, uh, and maybe a Merlot. What do you think? Yeah. Um, uh, Saul, thank you very much. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, and obviously, um, to, to listen to somebody who's got that level of expertise is, is in fact, yeah, is a is a is a great experience. So, on behalf of Assurity and on behalf of everybody who's joined us on the uh, the, the webinar, thank you. Really, really appreciated your contribution. Um, Chris and Russ, you were okay, I think. Yeah, uh, great effort. Um, and again, thank you for your contribution. Um, to everybody else, um, please. Um, provide us with your feedback. Uh, we will be running more of these, and obviously we do listen to your feedback and structure these um, to reflect that. Um, thank you for attending. Um, and I do apologize if we didn't get round to your question. There were, in fact, many, many questions that came up. So on behalf of everybody, um, thank you, and have a great rest of your day. And thank you, Steve, thank you. for moderating the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day, all. Cheers.